So hello, hello, welcome and thank you for coming to Shangram Bujandar's uh, Visiting Artists Lecture. This lecture is the 20th in the North Seattle College Art Gallery's Visiting Artists Lecture Series and the last one for the fall quarter. I'm Amanda Knowles, the coordinator of the NSC Art Gallery and I am the printmaking and drawing instructor at, art, at the art department here at North Seattle College. I'm pleased to work with Karen Stuldreyer, who assists in the gallery, does a lot of work on Instagram for the gallery, um, and is assisting behind the scenes here, here today, letting people in. We have live transcript available for those of you who want it. Those of you who don't want it or find it distracting, uh, you can turn it off by clicking the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and selecting hide subtitle. Use it if you wish, hide it if you wish, but we want to be sure that we have it for those that need it. First, some acknowledgements, and I will share my screen. So first, the land acknowledgement. North Seattle College acknowledges that we occupy the lands of the Coast Salish peoples, the descendants of the first peoples of this region, a people whose cultures endure and are valued. Without this land and these cultures, we would not have access to this gathering, dialogue, and learning space. We take this moment to honor and thank the original caretakers of this land, their ancestors and their descendants who are still here. We encourage participants here today to consider our responsibilities as we stand in solidarity with the sovereignty, cultural heritage and lives of native indigenous and first nations people and a labor acknowledgement. We also pause to recognize and acknowledge the labor that created the United States and from which we all benefit. We remember that our nation is built on the labor of enslaved people who were forcibly brought to the US from the African continent, and we recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. We acknowledge immigrant labor and recognize that voluntary forced and prison labor contribute to the building and ongoing maintenance of our nation. We acknowledge all unpaid caregiving labor. Additionally, we acknowledge the critical importance of the work towards racial equity that continues across this country in response to racial injustice and generations of structural racism against BIPOC communities. Thank you. This next slide uh, shows what we are doing as we continue to work to go from acknowledgement to deed. It is not enough to just acknowledge the land and labor. We, we have to be sure that we are taking action. We show you here what actions North Seattle College and the NSC Art Department are taking to support BIPOC individuals and institutions and to be held account accountable. We recommend Real Rent Duwamish, and we will put that link in the chat for you to explore. Thank you. Uh, we wanna let you know about an in-person opportunity. The M. Rosetta Hunter Art Gallery at uh, Seattle Central College and Unapologetic Artists and Creatives announced the closing reception of Porches, Panthers, and Progress this Thursday, December 9th. 5 to 8 p.m. The show centers on the porches and porch side culture of Seattle's Central District. Through contemporary historical and historically recreated photographs and mixed media installations, this exhibition draws links between porch culture, maintenance of communities, activism, and the impacts of gentrification and celebrates the richness, courage, resilience, solidarity, strength, and unity of Seattle's Black culture. The exhibition originally opened just days before the pandemic lockdown and in the months after that, the world was enveloped in the isolation of quarantine. And then just as quickly rose in solidarity to protest the killing of George Floyd. The closing reception is a time to reflect on the impact of the last year and a half, as well as the content of this exhibition. I see Megan is here, so very good. Uh, we will be back in the art gallery ourselves next quarter, winter quarter, January 2022, with a group show entitled The Sun, the Moon, and Stars, which opens on Monday, January 24th. The gallery will be open Monday through Thursday, 11 to 4 p.m. while the show is up. For that, we will be mandating a wellness campus check-in as well as masks. We will continue to have virtual visiting artist lectures during this time. We are planning two for our next quarter, including a lecture by our jewelry teacher, Barbara Knuth. Please stay tuned, checking in with the gallery on Facebook, Instagram, and our website to find out who will be talking and when. We will stick with the Monday 12 to one timeframe. Uh, and we urge you to visit our website for links to recordings of all this quarter's talks, as well as last year's lectures and the list of upcoming visiting artists. Uh, we will post those in the chat. 
Thank you. And with that, it is time to introduce you to today's visiting artist, Shangram Majumdar. Uh, Shangram was born in Calcutta, India, and moved to the US as a 12 year old. Uh, he holds a master's of fine arts degree from Indiana University and a bachelor of fine arts from Rhode Island School of Design. He has shown work both nationally and internationally with recent solo exhibitions at Geary Contemporary in New York, Stephen Harvey Fine Art Projects in New York, and the Asia Society Texas Center. He has worked in an upcoming group show entitled The Glass Bead Game, which runs December 10th through January 28th, 2022 at Mammoth Gallery in London, England. His selected awards include a Mellon Faculty Fellow in the Arts, a New York Foundation for the Arts Grant in Painting, a Purchase Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters in New York, a McDowell Fellowship, a residency at Yaddo, the 2009-2010 Marie Walsh Sharp Studio Space Program Grant, and a Maryland Institute College of Art Trustees Award for Excellence in Teaching. In 2019, he was inducted into the National Academy of Design. His work has been reviewed in Art Forum, The Brooklyn Rail, Hyperallergic, among others. Along with his website and Instagram handle, we have included a link to an interview with Shangram uh, through Hyperallergic and a link to the Mammoth Gallery show. He is a frequent contributor to Two Coats of Paint. He has also lectured on his work at numerous institutions around the country, and we're honored to have him here today. Last summer, Shangram moved with his family here to Seattle where he was hired as an assistant professor of painting and drawing at the University of Washington. I will hand you over to Shangram, but before I do, I wanna let the audience know that we will be taking questions in the chat today. So if questions or comments arise during the talk, please write them in the chat. I will, I'll be paying attention to that. I'm sure Shangram has other things to do and won't be doing that. And uh, we will hopefully get to all of your questions. As usual, we'll be sending a transcript of the chat to Shangram after the talk. So if you want to comment on the work and his words, please do. Um, you might be specific about what you're commenting on as he will be seeing your words after the talk. But I urge you to support him, his ideas, and his work in the chat. Welcome to Seattle, and thank you so much for coming to speak with us, Shangram. Done. OK. Thank you, Amanda. That was wonderful. Um, Amanda uh, got in touch with me, I think a while ago, quite maybe over the summer, end of summer. I feel like, I mean, in terms of organization, I feel like you win uh, in terms of how, um, how early, because sometimes, you know, I do this myself, I'll get in touch with people like two weeks before. <laughs> so I really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. So, uh, and thank you to all who are here. I'm going to just jump in and I will try to keep this to stop around 1240 approximately. So I'm going to talk um, at a fairly rapid pace. It'll just sound like a half an hour run on sentence probably. Uh, <laughs> but yes, please, uh, um, if you have something specific that grabs your attention, maybe um, uh, um, we can loop back around uh, to talk about it. So I'm just gonna start screen sharing right now. The presentation is broken up loosely into four parts. Um, the first part is a little bit of context around thinking um, that shapes how I work. Um, I'm a painter. You know, the, the primary part of my practice is really involved with painting and painting related activities. While I use other tools and devices, everything kind of funnels through eventually into a painted image. So I'm going to show some kind of context around uh, where things come from. Um, then I'm going to show you probably uh, a body of work that um, I would say is precedes what I've been working on for the last three, four years. In between, I will probably uh, talk a little bit about my process because I feel like that's something that comes up a lot. And I feel like that's also helpful um, to see. And sometimes, especially for those of you who are makers, it might be helpful. And then I'll end with the most recent work. Uh, I will end literally with a photo from my studio from an hour ago. So it's, it's literally as re recent as you can possibly get. So this is a photo from kind of a dormer room above the garage in my mother-in-law's house in Anacortes. And uh, so I've been coming to Seattle 
for the last 10, 12 years since um, I met my partner, who obviously then was not my partner. But anyway, so um, and so it's it's been interesting and exciting to move to a place that I've encountered primarily for three to four weeks uh, every year, uh, generally during the ideal period, which is like end of July through middle of August, that that phase, as you all know from living here. And it uh, seems like I decided to move to Seattle during the wettest year ever. So <laughs> everyone's everyone's asking me about the rain and I'm reporting back that it's 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 it rains. Yes, it does, but life goes on. Um, so um, one thing I wanted to start with is uh, this is a phrase that I find really relevant uh, for me as a person and as a maker and something I love Sarah Ahmed's writing because when I first read the book, Phenomenology of Whiteness, I felt like the book was written with me in mind or, you know, somebody um, from my background. And it's always interesting to see my presence in somebody else's voice. And specifically, I think uh, the notion of intimacy and the notion of place um, has been this running thread through my work. Um, I don't think I always thought of it that way. But I think, you know, hindsight sometimes clarifies intent more so than when somebody's in the present moment of making. This is uh, the, the, the painting on the, above that door is probably the first painting I ever saw uh, or I anywhere I remember. It was painted by my dad. It doesn't exist anymore. I remember growing up with it. It was really dirty because I think it had been varnished too many times and yeah, this is this is probably a photo of me from, you know, a year or two, maybe before I moved to the US. I wanted to share with you two photos. Also, one of the Janta and Elora caves on the top left and uh, obviously their Roman Forum. I think one of the ways I think about painting is in, in relationship to time and time, both experiential and something that can be, that plays itself out within the canvas, but also the oddness or asynchronous nature of how a painting exists in once it's completed, as in this kind of atemporal condition, it just doesn't do anything. It kind of is, it is basically, but its experience is kind of contingent on a viewer's experiences on viewer's memories and a viewer's kind of place in time, so to speak. Um, so for me, uh, I often think of painting as a journey, uh, as a destination. I think the word place will reappear over and over again and place uh, where different types of time can coexist within the picture format. So I think in terms of the idea of going somewhere, um, the idea of a destination for me is also interesting because I don't think of it as a fixed point, uh, but a series of points, a series of places that uh, a place can be like the, uh, like an entire book, basically, you know, the place can be an object. And so for me, um, I'm often thinking about a painting in relationship to uh, a place you can navigate to and from that can hold uh, both physical experiences and metaphoric experiences all in one place. So I think in terms of those images that I've been showing, I think a place that I often come back to is uh, film and filmmakers like Bresson or Tarkovsky, um, just a handful of references uh, who really are attend to uh, individual moments as much as the, the larger narrative. So for me, uh, how something is constructed matters and not do in a precious sense, but that everything has a place and purpose, uh, uh, at least in the moment of making. And I think the other part of that is, uh, that links up with that is geometry. I kind of grew up in a place where architecture is loaded with history. And alongside with that, there is, you know, that you're very much aware of the armature uh, that you're experiencing and you can always see through the armature. Uh, the left is a photo through a window of the house I grew up in. And the right is a section of a wall in um, South India, uh, basically in a temple site where a wall has been constructed from remnants of temple shards and stones from local quarries. So this notion of uh, this composite or a collage uh, built around 
objects from different timelines is something I often think about in the making of a painting that is both a physical experience and a temporal experience. And that uh, there's also this relationship to the body coming through. <laughs> I know that was a big jump. Uh, so moving from that wall to this uh, stock photo of lasagna. I don't make lasagna. Actually, I don't really like lasagna. I'll just say that. Um, I'm sorry if you like lasagna. But I often think about the notion of layers, you know, just like a layered space, like the Roman Forum or layered condition of a wall, uh, vertical layering, but also that when you layer something, you, you're you not, you know, uh, that it's not lost, right? And, and I often think of food as a good metaphor for anything like a cake or a lasagna, that it, it, this construction requires layering, but it's also leads to a, a more complex experience right uh, in terms of the eating that as you're eating you, know, you can feel the texture of i guess here would be the spinach and you know and the ricotta and the tomato and maybe their sausage i don't know so for me just because what is visible on the surface might be one thing that it's not purely about the surface that the surface is perhaps a window or an opening uh, or a peek into some uh, uh, subsequent layers that are worth also remembering and paying attention to. So the way I'm going to kind of talk about my paintings is really kind of uh, in, in these two groups, I would say um, paintings uh, of places as opposed to paintings as places. Probably what links up the work all together in a way I would say is a recurring uh, and uh, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, and no, I, I can't even say it's an interest. It's, uh, I think it's almost part of my DNA, an obsession with finding ways to metastasize a uh, sense of liminality, um, you know, to make itself present, uh, the sense of what was and what's next, uh, or if you want to call it a sense of in-between. I think um, the condition of in-betweenness is very much a self-aware position, I think, for most people who are shifting between different cultural spaces, whether you think about double consciousness uh, or the notion of, um, or for immigrants who are moving from one cultural space to another space, or, you know, in some ways, if you're constantly in communication with different generations. And for me, painting is an interesting place to explore this because of its seeming impossibility. Uh, because it's not a time-based object uh, or an experience, that it's a thing, uh, I'm interested in how an image can actually hold different types of times uh, within itself. So one way um, I kind of started uh, exploring this, I think, in hindsight, is I was really invested in the particularities of experiences that can be created, that can be seen as an experience visually, you know, kind of a one-to-one -one relationship, uh, something in front of me. And that, and I kind of believed, or I mean, in some ways, I still believe that the, uh, the experience that you go through to make something does manifest in terms of the object itself, or can anyway, uh, if you wanted to. Um, so for a while, I made these paintings where I would construct these, uh, I said, I suppose you could call them still lives, you could call them scenarios or stagings where um, there were a combination of found and, and, and recreated events. And, um, and the paintings would be one to one scale, as in everything is the size it is in real life to some degree. And uh, the, the surface would often be tipped forward. Um, so the, the picture plane kind of pulls up and very much about creating a condition uh, where there is no one thing. Uh, and I think I landed with this relationship of still life because it is probably in terms of the historical genre is the least, I suppose, um, narrative in, in a certain way, which itself opens up to possibilities. Um, and I like the idea of making a painting that can that can flip between figural and landscape kind of metaphors um, as you're working. Also, the fact that a painting can exist as two different things, you know, like this is a painting of scraps of paper shards on top of a photo collage, but the photo collage is of, of a room, so to speak. Um, here's a painting of a projection of a room inside of a empty painting studio. 
So the kind of doubling of spaces uh, is something that I've constantly been interested in, where two things are happening simultaneously. Uh, at times, I've made paintings where they're incredibly staged with figures, uh, where everything would come in, everything but the kitchen sink. And I think um, their paintings, I often talk about this sometimes with my students there, I think development of a painter or an artist often has to go through these stages of uh, demonstration and action. Like I think some works we, you know, when you first start painting or making any kind of work, there's a big part of that is involved in being able to tell yourself you can do something uh, through the act of making it. Um, and at some point, uh, you kind of maybe put that aside, uh, perhaps for some people. Uh, so for me, what's always been interesting is trying to figure out what I can get away with or what kind of uh, tension I can build into the work that kind of works against my inclination to do something, whether it's taste, whether it's the notion of uh, a finish, or even um, the idea of a painting holding something that um, I want to look at. So these are um, some paintings. Uh, I would say right about here, my painting started shifting away from physical spaces that uh, are one-to-one -one scale, in something in our lived space that echoed or, or um, I suppose, were kind of a stand-in or a surrogate for the body in some ways, to paintings that really became about places fully, uh, where the notion of staging took on a bigger place. And for me, the notion of a staged place often is a great container for an event to happen. And I think in the other way, this opened up the possibility for forms to exist as uh, almost anthropomorphic uh, or anthropomorphized Figurally, you know, plants kind of shifting gears and becoming one thing. And so for a while, I was making these really large paintings. These are all about seven feet vertical, where the figure left fully. And I was working with um, almost imagery that uh, would come from an exterior space or would come from nature. Towards the end of that group of paintings, I actually, this is about 2016. After doing a bunch of those paintings, I kind of decided I wanted to... I think I got tired a little bit with um, the Baroque uh, geometry to some degree. You know, I feel like I'm a painter who really likes to put a lot in. Um, and, I, and for me, when I was making paintings like this or paintings like that or these, uh, one thing that I was really interested in is the simultaneity, you know, that simultaneity of figure of ground or the simultaneity of a top and bottom or the fact that every corner uh, you're constantly moving between um, multiple types of spaces or you're aware of multiple types of spaces. So for me in that way, the notion of the liminal was a condition that I was trying to maintain through the making of the work and through the way the work would arrive for the viewer. I think in these places, um, it became more of a place for action, you know, a place waiting for action or a place uh, holding future action in place. And um, this gives you a little bit of a sense of, uh, of scale. And so right about around that time, 2015, 2016, I decided to kind of empty things out. And I really uh, was exploring, you know, uh, because a lot of these paintings were quite deep spatially. I wanted to make some shallower paintings. I think in hindsight, I think I was making space for what was to come next. And, um, so at this point, I'm going to kind of like pull back a little bit and show you a little bit of my process. And, you know, so this is kind of a, a photograph of part of a, a stage set that I would build, work with, found um, elements, uh, collage elements for my paintings. So one thing that shifted probably, I would say, for me from that last when I was working on that last body of work that I showed to what I'm doing now is the role of drawing changed. And for me, drawing has often been uh, a parallel practice, something that at times have been something I do uh, completely independent to the paintings I make. They have their own purpose and life. And other times drawings are really precursors or adjacent to the paintings. And then as I was doing that, um, one of the things that started happening is I, it started, I started kind of thinking a little bit about bringing more of that vocabulary into my paintings, which then kind of turns 
um, made me start thinking more about instead of thinking of painting of places, that painting as a place. And I would say probably the other thing that shifted with these shallower paintings that I was showing you, as the space began to conflate and kind of come together, a lot of these paintings are made from physical collages. So I went from painting uh, dimensional spaces to painting, uh, working from things like this uh, or things like this, or um, uh, actually I'll go to this image over here for a second, um, to images like this. So uh, in a way the drawing started kind of being uh, cues or precursors or suggestions that I was making to myself for how to enact um, the paintings. Uh, it opened up a lot of decisions as well, moving between media like tape and collage and digital printouts and digital collages uh, and digital drawings to fairly straight up, you know, drawings like the ones you're seeing here. You know, the left over here, by the way, is, and if you can read it, they're drawings of hand gestures from, I think, one of the most recent stand-up routine by Aziz Ansari. And um, at the same time, I was kind of thinking a lot about the role of hands in art, in culture. And this is around 2016, 2017. Just think timeline wise, historically, what was going on in this country that should give you a sense of the level of anxiety that I think was probably prevalent across the country and probably across the globe. I think around that time also, um, I began to start thinking of bringing the body back, both uh, thinking of the body both um, as an idea, but also relating it to specific people. Uh, and for me, it was more personal in the sense that it was kind of around the time, well, it was around the time uh, our daughter was born. So it was like five now. So I started kind of thinking in a more along a semiotic lens of shifting and thinking, uh, sh kind of seesawing between the role of sign and its corresponding object. Object and thinking about what would happen if a sign uh, allowed an object to come forth and or in some cases specific objects or specific figures or characters could lead to a sign itself. Um, so this is where the role of the walking figure comes in for me uh, both and then also as a sign itself for a liminal action, uh, a step between the past and the present. And so kind of like churning these things around in my head, the next group of paintings that you're gonna see uh, are really a result of some of these drawings. Oh, this is a drawing, um, this is this is COVID project um, happening, in, you know, uh, this is I think last or two summers ago at this point now. And I'll talk more about that. So here are some, these are other ways I draw. Sometimes my drawing is this, you know, um, happens, my work doesn't just always happen in the studio. It happens wherever I have time to work sometimes. Okay, so that kind of will kind of leads into maybe the most recent group of paintings that I would say uh, thematically connect around this standing moving figure. And so I'm just going to kind of cycle through these images. So uh, this piece, Cassandra Siren, um, if you recall, I showed an image a few seconds ago, right here on the right, is really comes out of this uh, Rajasthani miniature painting of a character that uh, with um, her hands raised and you know, I think for me, uh, because some, I'm somebody who's always looking at different kinds of images, different images take on different potential. And I don't know if I would have been interested in this specific image had it not been that while this is happening, while I'm thinking about the figure and the notion of liminality and my personal connection to it, um, you know, everything that's going on in the country from police shootings to toppling of monuments um, and, um, necessarily so. Um, just, the, just the tension that's palpable. I think um, um, I found something from the past taking on an urgency that I felt I wanted to explore. Um, so this is the first painting that came out of that period when I, I'm bringing the figure back. And I suppose one thing that um, these paintings and the collages really also brought up for me is um, the role of absence uh, or the role of showing versus hiding or um, explicit versus implicit information uh, and in some cases the presence of the body or the presence of the figure and I think while the you know everything that was going on around the 
uh, immigration crisis and people being deported or legal immigrants not being allowed to reenter the country. Um, I think I found myself thinking a lot about what it means to be visible uh, and what it means to be present um, and 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 what kind of role. Um, and I've often felt a little bit of um, felt uncomfortable painting as much as I like painting the figure I've, in my paintings, the figure has always been quite embedded. Uh, I've always been uh, drawn to, I think, artwork and experiences where the body becomes part of a space. And um, so I found myself kind of really kind of exploring that in a more overt way in the paintings, which um, really kind of brought out the notion of uh, once again, some of those early images I was showing, I was thinking about those collaged walls and thinking about the kind of the wire, the metal work of windows, uh, and even the grid that happens on a walk sign that allows the LED to shift it from the hand to the walking figure. And uh, so the most recent group of paintings come out of all of these things, you know, so, and they're very much um, uh, about making um, explicit the evidence of the different time places, different stages, uh, both through mark making, shifting between line work and color work, as much as specific kind of figural signifiers throughout the through and throughout the painting. Um, and they're also built out of different parts in time. They're you know like this painting is you know, my hand alongside my daughter's hand with my head, with her shoes, with a figure uh, from kind of a historical reference and a foot from a miniature. So I kind of like this mashup that um, is something that has kind of opened up the potential, I feel like for me to put things wherever I want them to the degree that makes sense in the paintings. And so that leads to, I suppose, the most recent paintings, which I would say, uh, as you've been saying, this is the painting I made, I would say, uh, right before I moved to Seattle. So I suppose early summer it was like the last, um, this gives you a little detail of the painting. And then this is a shot of my studio as of an hour ago. And so, I think I'll stop right here, actually. And maybe this is a good place to take questions. Um, I, I know I ran through at a fairly rapid fire pace, but we can dig into some things a little bit more uh, for sure. Um, as you know, it's hard to talk about everything in a, in a talk, but I wanted to just give you a general sense of the work now in relationship to um, the work from maybe the last 10 years. Wow, thank you so much. Thanks for that uh, quick look, um, but really um, deep look into what you've been doing. Um, I, I, I don't know, I always start with a question of my own and I, just to maybe feed the, the fire. Uh, sure. and so I, I guess mine is not really a question this time, but more of that idea that I never really thought of. I'm not a painter, um, but I never really thought of a, a painting being like this really rigid thing where you're taking a piece of the world and really reproducing it. Um, and you are, you know, turning that on its head. And I just think that that's really interesting that you don't, you're not necessarily doing that. You're not necessarily um, creating, I mean, obviously that's different abstract to um, representational, but you're not really like rigidifying something that exists out in the world. And I think that that's kind of a beautiful little taste of something. Yeah, I think, I think sometimes there is this, um, I don't know, I guess one way I kind of think about painting in relationship to another still image world, AKA photography, is you know as uh, you know photography and if somebody's a photographer here they'll probably completely disagree with me but one aspect of photography that I often think about is how it's a it's the documentation of a past moment you know like in a way it's a you know it was and and for me I'm interested in and maybe you know you can kind of talk about it in other ways but that a painting uh, can hold different things 
in time simultaneously. Like the fact, especially not all paintings, uh, but some, if there's a mark present, then there is this that's made through the body, then the the body is kind of activated and uh, and almost reanimated. And I'm interested in uh, how different types of reanimation creates different time spaces within within uh, uh, which kind of opens up painting into uh, something that can be experienced in different ways. Yeah, beautiful. Um, I know somebody wanted you to talk a little bit more about the movies that you've shown and, and how they sort of work into, or the, the stills that you showed and how that works into your work. I think those, uh, those are, I mean, I, I suppose I could have shown more. Okay, let me go back to the PowerPoint really quickly. I'm just going to open that up. Okay, there we go. Can you see the, the, the thumbnail view? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll just go back to this one since we're talking about it. I think for me, um, um, so the bottom photo uh, or the bottom still, uh, I love that because actually that, uh, I remember seeing that movie. I can't remember when I was, I think I was an undergrad, at, you know, and I saw that movie and, you know, loving these zones and how color coded that painting is and how staged it is. And I remember, um, you know, I often will go back and, rewatch things and I was taking a still and then I missed the time frame and there was this pause before the other uh, you know the figure goes into the the woman goes into the bathroom and then and on the right is what's going to happen next and I love how that frame how that scene holds like a red band and a black band and a white band and I just love the geometry of that and I think that was in my head uh, and I wanted to make like a triptych like that kind of had that. So I think for me, when I made, um, I think I was thinking about that when I, when I made uh, these three paintings still, not literally, obviously, but I kind of wanted to make a group of paintings that had these elemental colors, you know, red, black, and white, or kind of some of the oldest colors, pigments across the, you can get across the world. Um, so that's one way. Sometimes I see something in it that I want to bring in. Uh, I think other times it's, I think, staging. I'm, I'm interested in, in, in individual moments and actions. I don't think, I don't think film factors into my painting uh, literally, like I don't paint from, from films. Uh, I don't, um, you know, but it's more, it's something that I know that nourishes my brain in a very subliminal way. And I know it does that. So I just keep, keep it going. Lovely, lovely response. Someone uh, says, thanks for sharing the drawing thread. It's always interesting to know how painters and their drawings relate to each other. And I'm gonna sort of roll that into another thing, which is that, do you see the change in the role of drawing having anything to do with your teaching? Because I know that sometimes teaching kind of like there are things one is interested in in teaching that then like starts to pull up things from elsewhere or maybe someone you're teaching or, you know, those kinds of things. Well, you know, um, I was listening to this talk with Catherine Murphy recently, and, and I, I feel like a lot of artists might probably say this, which is I think sometimes teachers learn more <laughs> through teaching than the students do. Uh, or, at, or another way of saying that is sometimes, I mean, I do think I've learned a lot about myself and my work and also just uh, communicating about the work uh, because I teach. And uh, in terms of drawing, um, I don't know. I mean, I suppose, I think drawing for me is such a, such a, a fundamental fundamental in a way, not basic, but fundamental as a core, uh, like a core thought. Um, I kind of think through marks, I think through action. And so it doesn't matter if I'm drawing on a notebook or on my iPad or, I don't know, doodling on something. I need to make marks. And I think drawings for me, you know, I could have, uh, there's like a whole body of drawings and uh, I a talk could be just around drawing uh, that I didn't show here uh, and mainly show drawings that are part of process. But I kind of think of drawing now as 
having three roles. I think drawings are about generating ideas, like you could call them sketches. Uh, I think I draw from my paintings when I'm painting. So to me, they are um, trying to work out a problem. They're a way to solve problems or to explore parallel possibilities. I print out my paintings and draw on them. And then I also make drawings uh, after the painting. So, uh, you know, after a painting is done, sometimes I'll make a drawing of it to see where the next move could be. So as in, um, you know, something after the fact. So, so yeah, I think drawing is a kind of a dimensional or a multi-dimensional thing for me. It's also a way for me to uh, imagine a mark differently than I would imagine it uh, if I'm holding a brush or a different kind of a tool. So that's why I like to draw with tape or paper or, you know, on my iPad. I like drawing with, <laughs> I prefer not drawing with things that mimic paint, actually, because, uh, and then I, I like that tension that it's, it feels so different than what happens when I pick up a brush, which then gives me ideas of how to make decisions on the canvas that I wouldn't otherwise do. Great, wonderful. Paula, do you want to ask your question? Um, you're uh, talking about scale. Yeah, um, thank you so much for that uh, that talk. I want to be a painter now. Um, <laughs> you um, can be. I can be. Um, so I, I do have a question. Um, I'm teaching 2D design and I think it's always interesting for students to consider how scale plays a role. Uh -huh. in the way that You want your work to be sort of received and I, I'm a sculptor uh -huh. so I always think about like the physicality of work and, and mm -hmm. I, yeah, many of your paintings seem fairly large in scale and so I imagine you see them in person and your body is relating them to them mm -hmm. a certain way and now I'm seeing right the figure is in there. So I'm just wondering how you consider the the scale of your paintings what, when the- yeah. when I think, thank you. Thank you for that question, Paula. Um, I would say uh, I definitely think about one way I think about painting is in relationship to place as place, uh, a place of action. But another way is in relationship to the body, very much so. Um, I often make this association that I like that a painting can be a person in the way um, a, a like an actual person, like a, as in somebody who has qualities that are annoying and admirable, uh, like most people, you know, so, so in that way that the person is not an abstraction, that they're actually a living, breathing thing. I think about that more and more in my paintings, that parts of it could be grungy and parts of it could be whatever beautiful means, or parts of it could be casual or formal or clever or I don't know, like whatever the mood, uh, what that different aspects can come in, you know, uh, annoying, what, what is to make an annoying mark, uh, you know, like nails on a scratch board, you know, so I do think about the body. And I think a lot of my paintings are, especially when they are top to bottom, they are this freeze like quality, I think of them as something that are parallel the shape and the height of a body loosely. And um, that's why they are at this point, 78 inches approximately that from about whatever, 10 feet away, they mimic uh, the, the height of a general person. Uh, but at times I also like exploring, I've always thinking about well, what happens if you scale them down, you know, this relationship between an image and an object uh, and the fact that we experience all of these things as JPEGs or on Instagram and what happens um, when they get shrunk down to this thing. I guess one way, um, I'm showing you this, this image here because I wanted you to notice like the scale difference between that dark painting, um, the really large one, and then the really tiny one. And there the scale was really important because I wanted the painting uh, that, that I made this one to be larger than life-size, almost monumental and uh, iconic in a way. So that was the reason to kind of up it to like eight feet. Uh, and I wanted this one to be small, not tiny, but I wanted it to kind of, um, I guess, kind of both kind of honor the size of the original reference, the miniature that I was thinking about, but I also like the idea of a quite small painting that is loud. 
you know, and it was really fun in the show to put the biggest painting next to the smallest painting and seeing what happens. And it held up, you know, so I do, I, as much as I like having certain ideas, um, I'm sometimes I'm like, well, what happens? Could this work? So I'm always experimenting with those things. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, I have another question. Uh, would you talk, uh, which can be said loud, but I, I'm going to say it. Um, and if that person wants to add more, they can. Would you talk a bit about how you make decisions as you're building the painting? What di dictates what is covered up and what is revealed and how working abstractly is different from working from observation or is it? I'm not an abstract painter, so I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, um, um, so I, I, you know, I can't, um, there was a period where I was making paintings that, uh, that had no figurative um, kind of imagery and everyone was talking about them as like they were abstract paintings. Um, how do I make them? Well, um, okay, so like I'll, I'll show this image and um, uh, Andrea, I saw you were here, so I'm, I might reference you. A, a, a friend, uh, Andrea, uh, was visiting and, and Heimer and uh, the painting on the right, uh, uh, I think we were looking at that painting. And at one point there were so many leaves on there because I was like, you know, I decided I was going to make a fall painting. And and then I realized, okay, that, well, that's, that's too much. Let's, we need to get rid of them. So I tend to be kind of, I put, I mean, this sounds easy, simple, but I really do put things in and I take things out. That's kind of how I paint. Uh, I have a general plan. I, st I start the painting. Uh, the paintings look very much like what they are from after the first two, three hours. But uh, what begins to change are, you know, the pacing, you know, I might, you know, spend a week trying to figure out where to put three leaves. And then, uh, but at then, it, you know, so it's, uh, it's, it's very much about, Pacing, I think a lot about pacing and I think a lot about like where I want things to speed up, where I want things to slow down, where I want things to feel empty, where I want things to feel dense, what kind of, um, where I want a kind of uh, be able to look through. Um, so I'm, I'm very much thinking about, I guess, moving and moving in different ways and um, through the painting, you know, like right now I'm working on this painting over here and you know i'm i'm drawing lines <laughs> so you know i've been i'm making a rain painting so i'm gonna just get it out of my system it's just gonna happen doing the fall painting and doing the rain painting uh you know sometimes i like the idea of starting with the most obvious decision um i've never made a rain painting i don't even know how to make a rain painting so sometimes the paintings are very much about trying to figure out like, well, I've never done that. How do you do that? You know, and, and uh, yeah. Does that, uh, did I answer the question at all? <laughs> sure. I mean, I think it's also interesting uh, reading that interview that you gave that you talked about, like uh, the sort of iteration that happens while making. Yeah. Um, and how that sort of changed recently for you. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about that or if it's not interesting to you, but like, as I make, I make in, in layers because of mm -hmm. how I was raised as a printmaker, right? Uh -huh. so that's uh -huh. really important. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't necessarily know going in what I'm going to get out at the end. Um, right. Right. Like now you're going in a little bit differently. So I'll let you be and talk. Yeah, well, you know, uh, because I also, um, I'm just going to open up an image and I'm just going to show this really quickly. I'm trying to grab a quick image to upload that, that could be helpful. Let me just put it in the, I'm just going to put it in the slide here. That's what all those spaces were at the end. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, exactly. You know, this is, uh, Can you can see this, right? Yeah. Uh, so these are, this is, you can kind of see what this is. This is kind of like, a, just like trying to figure out, well, what it might look like. This is um, a digital collage that I'm drawing on top of. This is me figuring out color. 
I also went and collected leaves and I just dropped them on the floor and started photographing them and drawing from them. You know, I, I pulled things from different, different places. And it, in terms of layering, uh, it's interesting. I think uh, I, I'm not a printmaker, but I'm interested in, I guess, uh, different types of layering. Like this is a very layered image that is actually painted uh, very uh, individually like everything is just painted once and left. And when I was painting it, I, I created a file uh, and where all the colors were separated. And I felt like I was, I, was, I was joking with a friend, like, I think I'm making like a 12 color print, uh, you know, that every color is a set of marks. And, and, you know, sometimes I use projectors to project a drawing and I will just follow that set of decisions. So, I don't have like one specific, like step one, I do this, step two, I do this. Uh, maybe the most consistent system I have is that I, before I, if I, if there's been a hiatus in the studio, like there was when I moved and I didn't make work for about four months, maybe longer. And um, I just had to start drawing. I start by drawing and I made, I don't know, over a hundred drawings and then just to get some stuff out of my system, figure out what to do. Uh, I draw from videos a lot, actually, to go back to the film comment. Sometimes I'll shoot videos and I'll draw from the videos and that's also helpful. Nice. Um, there's also one other question, which is, could you please speak more about your inner shift away from Baroque still lives to your current work and how that felt to break out of that box? Oh. Yeah, maybe Baroque is not the, the correct term. Maybe the term I should use instead is a kind of all over, kind of a more is more kind of approach, this kind of uh, where everything, every part of the surface is just like active and just tense. Um, not a lot of quiet spaces. Um, how did it feel like? Um, in some ways, I don't think that that's changed. I think what I'm trying to do is give a lot of space to color um, and specific colors and see how they can create um, a similar condition. Like one thing I'm really interested in, I didn't even talk about color, but is uh, how color can set, create atmosphere um, or climate actually, I should say. So like a weather pattern. And I'm interested in how, you know, like this painting is just two decisions. It's the, it's, it's just the charcoal lines and that yellow green. Um, while then sometimes it's like lots of uh, stacking of marks and colors. So I think I'm interested in the notion of a wall or a surface that is very um, self-aware in, in the painting that, so that when there's an opening um, or things break into imagery or image particulars, that there's a counterpoint. But I, I think it's also a way of reductive uh, thinking. Like I'm just like, I think just taking things away. I'm interested in just taking things away that's not necessary and just only having, uh, having trying to make every part of of every decision that's visible, clear. I guess clarity is something that I'm always trying to strive towards with the paintings. Clarity not in the sense that everything is legible, but clarity in that, from my point of view, from my end of ma as a maker, that I have a sense of clarity as to why I'm doing something, you know? When I don't, uh, I think in the past when I didn't know what to do, I just kept painting. And I think now when if I don't know what to do, I, just, I stop and I go do something else. Kind of follow the, I think it's a Agnes Martin quote, like if you're at the studio and you're thinking about going to the beach, you should probably go to the beach. I don't, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to be, I, I, there's one more question, but I want you to yeah. know. 104, so I want to be... Um, I'm okay. I can go for a little bit longer. It's all good. Okay. I want to respect your time. So yeah, um, you. the question is, um, what impact has becoming a parent had on your work and art practice? And, and that's another one by Paula. So Paula, if you want to ask more detail or nitty gritty about that. 
I mean, it's it's a just something I'm curious about. I don't know if it does have an impact or if it's anything you're interested in in talking about. But you know, you did mention you're a child, and uh, yeah, I don't I don't really mind talking about it. I think I think it's interesting how um, over the pandemic when there is so much. Uh, it's it's interesting to see what work has has become people are noticing or paying attention to because everyone's inside whether it's the notion of home whether it's intimacy whether it's um, shows centered around artists who are parents and yeah so um i think one way i would maybe think about it is as you know in terms of working with this notion of a sign leading towards a figure or a specific kind of a figure versus a figure uh, or a person becoming a catalyst for an idea, uh, a specific person. I think there are some paintings, um, there's a few paintings that, uh, I mean, there's obviously paintings I didn't show, but um, this painting specifically is completely based on my daughter, just kind of, you know, a little, a little dance, um, dance she was, it's all pulled from like a dance like a video i took of her dancing and with her permission and it's very i'm very aware of those kinds of things and i often say like do you mind if i take a video and she sometimes she'll say yeah sometimes she'll say no so she often often has the has to okay the, my decision a little bit but so this is a pain that came out of that but in general like you know and then I did a whole body of drawings that are actually now part of an exhibition um, and it's kind of I guess in some ways a collaborative practice where uh, where uh, my daughter was making drawings and I was making drawings of her hands and we just were drawing on same colored same paper so they're kind of pairing so we had this thing going I can work on a drawing as uh, as long as she's working on her drawing. And if she switches to a new drawing, I have to switch to a new drawing. So, um, I mean, those are some ways, you know, and I, I mean, uh, some things came out of that and I'm kind of pondering where those, what can happen with those right now. But yeah, it's definitely a running thread. Some, I think some most cases it's, um, just something that's happening around me. And sometimes I'm, um, I make conscious decisions and other times, you know, they're not so conscious, I suppose. Um, yeah. Um, just sorry, to, I don't know how vague my answer was, Paul, I'm sorry. <laughs> just to be um, really uh, obvious about it is that Paula was a co-curator of, of one of those shows that you just actually talked about was like what being a parent, you know, being a parent and you can talk about it, Paula. I mean, yeah, it's just, you know, I, I saw some of these kind of collaborative processes and, yeah, yeah. you know, sometimes when you're a parent and then you're, and then COVID happens and you're stuck at home and now you're yeah. teaching remotely and you're moving, like all those things, it's like, yeah, sometimes it's forced to mm -hmm. kind of become a part of something. And um, mm -hmm. so it's just mm -hmm. interesting to see how different artists um, yeah. uh, respond to that experience and, yeah. uh, you know, whether those things become anything or not, or yeah, they were yeah. just about that moment. And yeah, then it changes so rapidly. Right. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I did a, a ton of these drawings. They're on my website. There's like a whole area of just like, I don't know how many I made, a ton of them. I, I, and um, and then I just stopped. And but they're they're around and I'm, they're kind of like funneling through my head in terms of what I can do with them right now. So they're actually something that I think I need to I'm planning on picking up fairly soon. And especially where the scale, I think, of these paintings will be quite different. I think whenever I look at look at these drawings as I was doing them, though, I was thinking of that that kind of that amazing drawing called "Paw" by Philip Guston of that hand making a mark. Um, you know, like that's one of my favorite one of my I think one of my favorite paintings. I think I can say that. You know, among among many paintings, um, I like how cl clear and straightforward that image is. And then there's something also about the hand that, although you're not drawing faces, a hand mm -hmm. is just as uh, expressive and that you actually were looking at, um, I've totally forgot what you were uh, looking at, but drawing hands. Yeah, like the, the, this group. Ah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and um, and I did a group of paintings that came out of that that were these um, these two paintings over here. Um, so they, they I, I may go back to this. I, I did a few, then I kind of stopped. So I'm kind of thinking of going back to these paintings a little bit. And there's also a beautiful thing that I, I'm kind of thinking about, which is this idea of um, making sure that the person that you're talking about agrees with you in terms of what they are. Because if we look at this, the outsider would think that they were abstract. And you were like, I am not an abstract painter. And that's a, such a beautiful idea of you know um, where we sort of put ourselves. That it, it talks to a lot, a huge range of things beyond art, of course. But it also is just so um, full in this Thank as well. You. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think because everything in a way revolves around the body for me, uh, process, imagery, um, the format, the surface, the tools, the methodology that I can't, uh, I, I don't know how I would not talk about these as, you know, you know, I think imagery is built into these paintings, um, whether they're explicit or otherwise. Uh, I don't always s s use the word figurative painter, but um, but I, I do think um, I am interested in representation as an as an idea, and and uh, and I'm interested in the body. So I I tend to just keep it at more and more. I kind of keep it there because. Um, you know, like is, is Jack Whitten an abstract painter? I don't know. In some ways, I think, I don't know, sometimes I don't think he is sometimes, even though he is in a certain way. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for um, just this lovely talk and then just answering so many questions and going uh, so much deeper with it. So um, we're just so pleased to have you here and, and welcome you to, to our town. Well, thank you so much. It was it was wonderful to be here, and thank you for all of your questions. Thank you for all coming. Uh, I recognize a lot of names and a lot of names I don't. So if if I if we run into each other in real time and place, please please say hello, and you can say I you know I was at your talk, and then I'll have some context, you know, um, and all these people without masks too. So like I probably won't know who you are because half of your face will be covered, as will be mine. So right. Um, well, thank you again, Amanda, and uh, have a great rest of the week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take thank care. Thank you.